Welcome everybody to the first of the AVERT International Speaker Series webinars. Um, it's a delight to have you all with us. Um, I know that probably some other people are going to be joining us in the next minute or two, so I hope they catch most of the introduction um, that I'm going to be doing. Um, it's terrific to see so many of you with us today. We've got a great mix of people from right across the academic and community and government sectors, which is very much what AVERT is about in terms of bringing um, those groups together. So that's really lovely. Um, my name is Michelle Grossman. I am the research chair in diversity and community resilience uh, at the Alfred Deakin Institute and the convener of the AVERT Research Network um, of terrorism and violent extremism researchers who are working both in Australia and also internationally. Um, so we are absolutely delighted to um, launch the first uh, of our international speaker series this evening with Dr. John Morrison from Royal Holloway University of London. Now, many of you would know John and his work, for, but for those who don't, John is a senior lecturer in criminology at Royal Holloway University of London, where he co-leads the master's program in terrorism and counterterrorism studies. Before joining Royal Holloway in 2018, John was a reader in criminology and criminal justice at the University of East London, where he also founded the Terrorism and Extremism Research Center, and in 2016 began producing the outstanding Talking Terror podcast series, which now has 71 absolutely fascinating episodes with leading scholars and other experts from around the world. The focus of tonight's talk is based on John's recent study, Assessing the Health or Otherwise of Terrorism Studies, and in particular, the critical areas of interdisciplinary and applied research. Um, and John um, assesses this through gathering together and analyzing the perspectives of various uh, terrorism and other experts um, who have contributed to the field and also contributed to the first series of Talking Terror. So just a couple of housekeeping things um, before we hand over to John. Um, we'll certainly have the chance uh, for um, what I hope will be lively and in-depth um, Q&A following John's presentation. Attendees are all muted, but please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens to put up questions during the talk or indeed afterward, and we will get to as many of these as we can during the discussion. Um, you won't be able to use the chat function to post questions um, for John, but if you are having any technical issues, you can certainly contact us using the chat tab for that reason, <coughs> pardon me. Um, we will be recording this presentation. So for those of you who may not be able to stay all the way through or, or who are otherwise interested, the recorded session will be uploaded on the AVERT website. So that's the housekeeping. And I think with that, over to you, John. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, Michelle, and everyone for the really generous invitation. I'm delighted. Uh, I'm delighted and honored to be invited for this. Um, when I got the email from Michelle asking about this, I had actually just finished reading Michelle's excellent uh, work with Vanessa Baralski, uh, looking at reintegrating uh, uh, families uh, in Australia. And it's, it just it seemed right that when I get an email from Michelle after just enjoying that work so much that I had to accept. There was no way I could say no. So I'm delighted to be here. I hope you all uh, find it uh, interesting, um, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A uh, afterwards. Uh, it's, I had a look at the participants, there's some recognisable names, there's some familiar names, so I'm delighted to, to see so many people there, so uh, thank you. I'll just share my screen in one second now. Um, so, Michelle, if you could let me know when, uh, when that is visible, I'll just... Is that all visible now for you? Uh, no, not as yet. Not yet. Okay, one sec. The joys of technology here. Um, now, Dr. perfect. Perfect. Okay, that's a word I like to hear at the beginning. So, uh, okay, I'll just just bear with me one second. So, as Michelle said, this talk is largely based on um, on some. Some chats I had with leading experts in terrorism and counterterrorism studies um, back starting in about 2016. Um, this was for my podcast series, Talking Terror, uh, which I hope one or two of you have listened to. And it's, I'll get into the origins of that uh, 
of that podcast late, uh, shortly. But beforehand, I just want to set the scene of where we um, where we are with where with terrorism research when I started the podcast. As with this area of research, so many times it was through so often during our history, we're at a period of self-review. So at the beginning of the 2000s, we had Andrew Silk and others questioning and looking back on the research that had been done and actually pointing out that, well, we, during the 20th century, late 20th century, we really weren't engaging with the methodological or, or analytical rigor that other areas were. And this was hugely worrying, um, especially in the aftermath of 9-11, where we had a lot of questions, a lot of practitioners coming to us and asking for answers, asking for that understanding. And if it wasn't based off the empirical research that other areas were, we couldn't really be grounding it and be as confident in what we were saying. However, if we fast forward uh, a number of years and you come up to Bart Shorman's latest work, which is continuing on this introspection, this self-review, we see that Bart's work is showing that now in the second decade of the 2000s, we had really t uh, come on leaps and bounds. We were now engaged in methodological rigor. We were now uh, a lot more analytically uh, uh, advanced in the way we were uh, engaging in these core research questions. But we still had a long way to go. We still had so many people who were just coming in uh, as single paper authors and leaving the area. We weren't having as much collaboration, but we were seeing a greater degree of interdisciplinarity. While Silk found in the late, two, in the late 1990s that there was a domination of politics, international relations, political science uh, in the research of terrorism, what we see from the work of Shorman and others in the years afterwards is that we're seeing psychology come in, we're seeing criminology come in, and a range of new disciplines, crime science, for example, coming in and giving us that in-depth understanding from those areas uh, to, uh, on the core questions relating to terrorism research. But then we get an article from Mark Sageman. And Mark, I have great respect for Mark, and so he has produced some excellent work in this area. But in in around 2014, he published this article in Terrorism and Political Violence, where he said that there had been a stagnation in terrorism research. Mark put forward the argument that despite over an, a decade of government funding and thousands of newcomers to the field of terrorism research, that we are no closer to answering the simple questions of what leads a person to turn to political violence. And that it's hard to escape the judgment that academic terrorism research has stagnated for the past dozen years because of a lack of both, uh, uh, a lack of both primary sources and vigorous efforts to police the quality of research. Now, while, while many people will focus in on what Mark said in that 2014 article, he wasn't the only one putting this argument forward. We actually have uh, Thomas Heghammer the year before in a speech that he was giving uh, in the United States, saying that there was a relevance problem uh, for uh, terrorism researchers in the eyes of those in security and policy, and a reputation problem within academia. And that Heghammer believed that this needed to be rectified, that this needed to be rectified by, for that reputation problem within academia, by not striving for this interdisciplinarity that we're all uh, that oftentimes we are talking about, that we're all looking for, but that we're, we are embedding ourselves in our own home disciplines, learning more about the theories and engaging more with the theories, whether that's in psychology, politics and international relations, political science, etc. And that from time to time, then dip back into the terrorism specific journals, journals like TPV, Studies in Conflict and Terrorism, etc. So what happened in the aftermath is there was a huge response, especially to Sageman's article. It's oftentimes due to the provocative title of, what he, uh, of which he gave uh, this article, a stagnation of terrorism research. But when you dig deep into what Mark was saying, Mark actually wasn't talking about terrorism research in general. Mark was talking specifically about terrorism research within the United States and its engagement with practitioners. But also, it's not 
broadly terrorism research within the United States. When we look at that first quote that Sajan puts forward, that we are no closer to answering the simple questions of what leads a person to turn to political violence, that's just one question that we have throughout a huge range that we need to be answering. It's one area, one question within this broad, uh, broad area of research studies, and we need to be expanding outside of that. And terrorism research isn't just about what happens in the United States. Terrorism research needs to be much more international. And we did have, in the aftermath of 9-11, dominance from the US, from the UK, et cetera. But we do have now, and I'm delighted that I'm speaking uh, to you as an audience, because what we see in the past few years is the proliferation of some of the best research internationally coming from places like Australia, coming from places uh, like Indonesia as well. There was an amazing special issue on disengagement and de-radicalization in Indonesia just published recently that we need to expand outside of the US and the UK um, and look uh, much more internationally. And that's one of the things that when I read Mark's article, it sort of... Uh, like you could see from the video that I don't have much hair to pull out, but it did have me pulling out what, what was left of my hair at times. But I wanted to engage with the responses. It wasn't just what Mark was saying that was uh, raising questions for me. What the responses that came, actually, that did raise questions for me as well. But there were some really good points that were made. So Jessica Stern, pictured here in this slide, Talk, dealt specifically with this question on are we any closer to understanding what drives a person, what leads a person to political violence? And she put forward, she rightly put forward that the questions relating to these individual decision makings aren't unique to terrorism experts. And actually, if we look at this uh, in other areas of research, they haven't come to the, to the answers that's, that Sajun was saying that we should have come to after these, uh, this period of expanded uh, funding and expanded engagement with uh, practitioners. And she is asking, and rightly so, why should terrorism research be held up on a higher pedestal to all other forms of research? Actually, by saying that we should be frustrated that we're not uh, closer to the answer uh, in that, is distancing ourselves from the complexity of what that answer would entail. It distanced ourselves from the heterogeneity of what it means to be involved in terrorism activity. What it means across context, across time, across uh, ideology, across roles within a certain group as well. These aren't simple answers. So Stern was saying, well, why should we be expecting simple answers from this? Macaulay and Moskalenko, Clark Macaulay and Sophia Moskalenko, question, said that when we're looking at the health of terrorism research, it's a subjective judgment in which different observers have different opinions. And actually, when I said that I was calling into question the, the responses as well, it wasn't what was said within the responses. It's the fact that when we looked at the responses, it was coming from the people who I greatly respect and have a huge amount of admiration from, but it would be the same people who we're calling on again and again and again for their responses. Brilliant scholars like Alex Smith, John Horgan, Jessica Stern and others. But based on what Clark Macaulay and Sophia Moskalenko said, that this health of terrorism research is a subjective judgment in which observers have different opinions. I sort of felt, well, let's get those different opinions. Let's try and see what other people who wouldn't be invited to give a response article might say about the health of terrorism research. So this came at a time where I was both bored and in need of self-motivation around 2016. I'd been going to conferences like Society for Terrorism Research and others and looking at sitting in on some really amazing uh, research being put forward. And I remember sitting in on the Society for Terrorism Research Conference that Bart Shorman organized in the Netherlands. And just saying to myself, I sit here, I look, I listen to these, but I never come around to engaging with this research in greater depth. I'm not able to get that broad understanding of the terrorism research field because I'm just concentrating in on my own area of looking at 
split in Irish republicanism, the role of trust in the psychology of terrorism and other sort of niche areas, uh, niche topics within the areas. So I sort of challenged myself saying, I want, I'm going to force myself to read outside of my area. And I tried to think, well, what's a way that I can force myself to do this? So I was chatting to my, uh, my former colleague, Professor Andrew Silk, who I still continue to do a lot of research with. And I said, look, I think I'm going to start a podcast. And he said, you're going to do what? Why are you going to do that? You have so much else to be doing. And I said, no, this is just to force myself to read what's out there, to engage with the research that's out there. So I set about designing a structure that would make me uh, do this. So the podcast was designed that I would be interviewing people Mainly at the beginning, I interviewed people who I knew, some close friends within the area, and it was meant to be only five episodes to begin with. But as you heard from Michelle's um, introduction, it got a bit out of hand, let's say, and uh, it's expanded outside of those original five plans. But I set about do putting a structure in place where I'd ask my, the interviewees for what were the pieces of research that inspired you or that influenced you. So they would select three pieces of research and send that on to me beforehand. They would also ask, want to highlight their own research and ask them to forward on 12, three pieces of research that they had carried out that they would like to discuss. And this was the way to force me to do that reading, to, do, to engage with research outside of my area, but not just hear about their own research, but to hear about the research that they thought was hugely influential for them. But I wanted to tag on another question because of this, still niggling thought in the back of my mind about that, that question of the stagnation of terrorism research put forward by Sageman two years previously. I wanted to ask them if they felt that terrorism research has stagnated. Because I was designing this podcast to emphasize, to show off the, work, the great research that was out there. And I knew I had an opinion that it hadn't stagnated. I had also an opinion that actually those who were saying it stagnated hadn't fully engaged with the research, uh, the broad research that was out there. So I thought that this was an opportunity not just to highlight the research that was out there and make it freely accessible to all, not, avail not just behind these uh, journal, um, journal paywalls, but that people could engage in an easy, free-form way. That it wasn't just going to be for an academic to sit down with a 10,000-word article, that a policymaker or a practitioner could listen in shorter, easier to access forms in, in able to engage with the research that was out there. And if they wanted to then be able to delve deeper into um, the actual articles themselves. So that boredom and need of self-motivation made me go on to, uh, to call up a few friends, call up a few contacts and try and get those first five uh, interviews. Now, the obvious person to start with was Andrew Silk because he was around the, down the corridor to me. And um, yeah, there was no getting away from it. But I ended up bringing people on board, some who I knew before, some who I didn't, but um, and wanted to get, uh, to get their opinions uh, on all of these aspects. But what I'm going to concentrate on today is that final question, that final question of the podcast, where I was asked them about how they felt the health of terrorism research was. But first of all, I want to break down who was I was talking to. I was, wanted to get a, as much of a mix as possible. I had research active staff, uh, re, everyone was research active. So 15 of them had been research active before 9-11 as well as after 9-11, and 28 had been research active in the aftermath of 9-11. I didn't want it just to be um, academics who were full professors. I, while I did have a dominance of full professors there, I also had 10 associate professors, eight assistant prof uh, profs, and five people who were research fellows, some who were freshly out of their PhD. To emphasize the interdisciplinarity of the research, I wanted to get that interdisciplinarity as well. And I don't measure just the interdisciplinarity just on what home department they're in. Because while I was introduced to, to you today as a, as a criminologist, my background is as a, as a psychologist. I did an undergrad in psychology, a, post, uh, a master's in forensic psychology, but a PhD in international relations. 
So I wanted to engage not just the disciplines that they were there with, but their, what their undergraduate disciplines were. So there is still a dominance of politics, international relations, and uh, political science, but we also have psychologists, historians, uh, theologians, sociologists, etc. people from, uh, and people who had then moved on into dis different disciplines like criminology, crime science, etc. Now, this is where I need to be very careful with this audience. Uh, the country of origin I had, I still did have that dominance from the US, uh, the UK, and Ireland, and, the, and uh, to gr my great shame, I've, I had to put the following sentence in, into the article. However, it does not reflect the other regional strengths within terrorism studies. For example, the high quality research being carried out by Australian and Australia based researchers. And I say that with all honesty, that some of the best research at the moment is coming from Australia and is uh, being developed by Australian based researchers. And I had, there was, I know Greg Barton is, is in the audience today, and I had reached out to Greg and others about uh, bringing them on board for the podcast. But when it came to that stage, it was just, I'd moved job and things were getting so busy. But I promise you that once the podcast comes back up and running, it will be a priority to highlight the brilliant research that is out there from Australia. So apologies for that. But that is to represent, to show that this shouldn't be considered a survey of the field. This is very much purposive sampling that I've used. Uh, th this, is, this is me engaging uh, with the people I knew and, and some other uh, contacts that I had developed and research, um, uh, all of which, all of who had developed research, which I greatly admire. But it is not all uh, the best researchers are, that are out there. And I hope to engage with more uh, from the area and from across the world uh, when I do relaunch, hopefully sometime soon. So what I did in order to develop this article was have a to do a thematic analysis of what the responses were, not just the responses to the final question, but the way that people engaged with discussions of the health of terrorism research in the broader gamut of the, of the interviews as well. There were four core themes that, um, I, that I emerged from that analysis. The theme of interdisciplinary research and researchers, theme of data, applied research, and area and field. I know I've probably rabbit it on a bit too long at this stage, but I will definitely concentrate on the first two, and if I have time, I'll concentrate on uh, the final two areas as well. What we see when respondents were talking about interdisciplinary research and researchers is that they were saying they were actually in disagreement with Sagemont. They were, on a whole, they were much more positive than Sagemont. They were still saying that, yes, there are areas that, where we need improvement and significant areas we need improvement. But as we see, um, as we see across the industries, they're saying there is no longer this disciplinary monopoly uh, coming from politics, international relations, and political science. And that actually, it's the highly skilled young researchers coming out of these new areas with great research method skills that are going to drive our area forward, that are going to drive us forward to really engage in high level social science research and research from the humanities. But it's not always just from those areas of research. We have people like Gary Lafree, who leads the Global Terrorism Database, talking about people from these disciplines which, who would never have connected with terrorism research before, who are now engaging with it. So this greater interdisciplinarity and highly skilled young researchers were um, were, were being highlighted as pushing our area forward. What I'm going to do is highlight some of the quotes that emphasize this. So this is Orla Lynch from University College Cork. She said, I think that compared to seven years ago, that it's in a fantastic place. If you go to conferences, if you hear PhD presentations, and this is what we hear time and time again in the industries, people not highlighting uh, the people who had been involved for decades, but it's those exciting young researchers at PhD level, postdoc level, early career researchers. If you hear PhD presentations, the type of work that's been carried out is the type of work that was cried out for around the time of 7-7 and in the years after. There's a sophistication around the research and there's a use of methods we haven't seen in the past. But when we look at 
interdisciplinarity of research, it's not just going to be about the methods that are brought. It's going to be about the way that we think about things. It's going to be about how we view terrorism. One of, and it's like, as you'll gather from this talk, I have a lot of pet peeves. But one of my other pet peeves about terrorism research was what I called the terrorist exceptionalism. That for so long, we have tried to say, well, what's different about terrorists? What is exceptional about terrorist actors and about the terrorist threat? But when we look at bringing in these broad range of disciplines, whether it's psychology, crime science, criminology, we can dispense with that. We can push that away and say, not what's different, but what is similar? What can we learn from these areas where there is something similar? But the use of the words like radicalization, et cetera, sort of tries to push it aside and say, there is something different going on in terrorism. But Noemi Bihana, I think, hits the nail on the head when she's talking about the role of interdisciplinarity. She said, I don't see terrorism as a special problem. I don't see radicalization as a special problem. Radicalization is a kind of socialization. We know a lot, and we will know a lot more about radicalization. It will not have the word terrorism in it, but it will still be relevant. At the end of the day, all the mechanisms will be general and shared across a whole bunch of problem domains. As long as we don't put up the barriers that this is not terrorism studies, let's not uh, look at it. It will, will be fine. And I think that's the way we move forward. It's not by trying to find out what's different about terrorism research. It's as Noemi said, it's not looking at it as a special problem. Part of our problem within terrorism research are words like terrorism and radicalization, which try to differentiate, which we use to raise alarm bells and saying there must be something so different. In order to move forward in this interdisciplinary way, we need to be able to engage with not what's different, but what's the same and we can really progress as an area then. John Horgan, who I know is one of your future speakers in this, he said that he was both sympathetic to Sageman's argument that there's some issues where, where we are stagnant. And don't get me wrong, researchers involved in these interviews were highlighting that there are areas of stagnation. But as Horgan emphasized, there are other areas where we're flourishing. There's been some really good research in recent years, whether that's Paul Gale, Emily Corner, et cetera. And these are researchers who are re doing really good work. Whether that be descriptive research or that it's research that's going to explain what's going on, but it's building more so now on a solid scientific rigorous research on terrorism based on those interdisciplinary areas. When we move on from interdisciplinarity, the next thing that was really focused on by my interviewees was this issue of data. For years, we were crying out of where's the data? How are we going to engage in terrorism research? And leading on to Silk's finding that it was really dominated by literature-based research. There were very few of us who were actually engaging in actual data analytics. We now have a higher quality of data that's out there. <coughs> this is what was being emphasized um, by the interviewees. There's a proliferation of databases like the GTD and others. But what we do need now, while we had previously the calls were, where is the data? We now have to have the calls of how can we systematically and appropriately engage with these data? We need to be able to know not just what the data are and what the data can tell us, we also need to know what the data cannot tell us. And that I feel is where we need to move forward as well. I did a review, uh, a piece that will be coming out soon in relation to how we analyze terrorism uh, interviews with former terrorists. As while well, many people would think of me as a podcaster, that's what I actually do, not as the side job, but as the main job, is engage with people who've been involved in violent dissident Irish republicanism and interview them. But what I found when I read some of the, some quite really good, really interesting research on terrorism, while we now have the data, uh, when we're looking at interviewing, we need to take a step forward in relation to how we analyze it. We need to be very transparent about our analytical techniques because that's where we need to take the next step forward. We now have the data. We don't have the same access to data that we would like for. We hear people like Gary LaFree, John Monaghan and others saying we don't have access to the prison data. But we have people like Emily Corner and others 
uh, who are engaged in really high quality uh, data analysis where we, there isn't as much of a reliance on the interview data out there. And we can be, uh, we can be really imaginative with the type of data that we can utilize and we can, the ways that we can assess the validities of the theory with it. When a close friend of mine, Paul Gill, who I, I, I'm sure many of you have read his work, emphasized to me that I, when we were doing our PhDs together, the call was for where is the data, but now it is more about, okay, how about your inter rater reliability, all issues like this. So we are moving forward in the questions we're asking. We aren't where we want, where we want to be, but we are getting much closer uh, to that area as well. We even had this recent Society for Terrorism Research Conference in Oslo, having the theme of the data revolution in terrorism research. And that this is something that we should all be excited about, but we shouldn't be complacent about it. It's not just about having the data, it's how we use it. And it's not just going to be about asking new questions with these data, but it's revisiting those old questions as Silk puts forward here, that we'll be asking those same questions from 10 years ago, from, uh, to, uh, right now, but the evidence base will be stronger and we might, and we'll be able to test and retest those previous findings as well. A lot of what Sageman was talking about within his research is this issue of applied research. The engagement between the re academic and the practitioner. Now, I was largely talking to academics. I know Mark Sageman wears two different hats in relation to academia and engagement practitioners. And for the academics I interviewed, actually, this issue of applied research was not as dominant for them when they're talking about stagnation, when they're talking about the health of terrorism research. They're more introspective into moving the academic aspect forward. There was no real consensus among my interviewees on how the terrorism research should be applied. But what we do have is that we have an acknowledgement from some that there is a growing practitioner, uh, there is growing practitioner awareness, uh, engagement. But also that not all terrorism research needs to be engaging with practitioners. Not all of it needs to be problem solved. There's a great quote from an academic called Robert White who said that our job isn't to condemn or to condone um, or to find an objective truth. Our job is to understand. I think that's where we need to be, first of all, in, before we can get, be engaging in applied research. We need to understand what's going on. Because without this understanding, first of all, we can't be of value in uh, engagement with practitioners. And it could be to the detriment as well of uh, CBE and CT policy as well. So we have to try, strive to get that understanding as our foundation before we can build upon that and make it apply. You hear, see, listen, hear from Erica Chenoweth, Mary Beth Altia and others saying that they don't feel that Sageman was, uh, they, the, Erica said, I do, do think where Sageman is a little bit correct is cooperation between practitioners, policymakers and academics. I do see a fair amount of it. I see a lot of it but I do think there is an opportunity for more collaboration in that space. Mary Beth talked about how she felt that decision makers were hearing us, were listening to us. But when we go on to people like Gary Lafree, leading up the, the GTD, he talks about, actually, yeah, while we might feel that science is informing uh, policy, it's perhaps much more, uh, it's not happening as much in reality. When he looked at criminology in my home field of criminology, for example, I think that we have had a huge impact on policy, but it is by no means a perfect one-on-one -on -one fit. Even if we were doing a far better job in understanding terrorism and reactions to terrorism than we are, I suspect politics is still politics. And there is going to be a lot of ability, uh, a lot of ability of politicians to and policymakers to ignore what we see as the fact. And that actually links on to what Max Taylor said in the interviews as well, is that we shouldn't be just thinking about who, about engaging with policymakers, but engaging with who are the right practitioners, not by talking to politicians, policymakers the whole time. It's about talking to people within the security industry, within the police services, and talking not to the right people, not uh, just uh, to people in, in those higher offices as well. 
So we need to be focused on not just being applied, but who it is applied with. And that final theme is that of area and field. And our, my, my interviewees said, right, uh, understandably said that Sajan was unduly narrowing the field in the way that he was looking at it. Unduly narrowing it by only looking at the United States. Unduly narrowing it by only looking at that question uh, of, of what leads a person to engage in political violence. The interviewee said that at times we focus too much on the overly dominant terrorist threats. We're moving from one dominant threat to another. And therefore, we don't have that basis of understanding, that foundation of understanding in those other areas to build upon. We don't see it through. Just because a terrorist uh, uh, organization or movement is no longer perceived to be a threat doesn't mean that we can't learn something from it. It has actually the optimum time to learn something from it, to see how they are disengaging, how they're leaving uh, terrorism behind as a movement as well as as individuals. So we need to take those opportunities. It shouldn't always be following what those dominant threats are. But it also highlighted from uh, my interviewees that there is still this Western-centric focus. And I admit, you can see that in my interviewees as well. But it is the obligation of when I'm relaunching the podcast, when uh, journals like Terrorism and Political Violence are calling for responses to uh, articles like Sagemans, that we're opening it up to new voices. We're opening it up to a broad range of, of academics and experts in this field to get a much more representative uh, understanding of this area of research as well. I feel, and this was... Uh, put forward by Javier Gomez in his interview as well, I feel that it is problematic if we consider terrorism research as a field in its own right, because then we would actually lose uh, the benefits that we gain from interdisciplinarity. We would lose what we get, the foundations from our core and from our home discipline. That it can be an area of study, but it's probably not uh, to the best uh, advantage of terrorism research to have it a field in its own right. But the area of critical terrorism studies was highlighted by a number of my, of my interviewees, not just people like Richard Jackson, who is dominant within the area of critical terrorism studies, but by others like Laura Dugan, Erica Chenoweth and others who are highlighting the strengths that critical terrorism studies, the, the advantages that critical terrorism studies has brought to this area in this time of self-reflection. John Horgan returning to John again, he said he conceded, talking about Satan, he conceded that his view about stagnation is some way is a dissatisfaction with the failure to address the motivation issue. That's fair enough. But to characterize the whole field of terrorism studies as stagnation is missing the mark. It just needlessly fuels this sort of debate. Now, I disagree with John about the it needlessly fuels this sort of debate. I think it's actually healthy for the area to have this debate and to have this time of self-reflection and to see uh, whether... Uh, we are in a healthy state. And with that self-reflection, be able to move forward. Laura Dugan, when concentrating on critical terrorism studies, and John Horgan actually also said that we need much more critical terrorism studies, even though himself and Michael Boyle at the launch of critical terrorism studies said that, uh, or said that uh, they did questioned the need for it. He is now saying that in the United States in particular, maybe they do need a, a dose of critical terrorism studies. Laura said critical terrorism studies is an important area where people are coming together and really looking critically. It's actually assessing what are other terrorism researchers saying and what kind of mistakes are we making. We, so, we see, so we have a self-examination component of this kind of research. I really feel that's important. Not just from, by applying uh, the, the teachings of critical terrorism studies, but expanding outside of there. Though that questioning of the field or the direction we're taking is hugely important. But I feel that it was actually happening before critical terrorism studies uh, came on board, but it has bolstered that in some way. So what should we, um, what should we do? What, what, how do we move forward? My wife actually saw this slide last night and was, uh, saw the picture and was like, oh, what, what on earth is that? 
I just said, oh, that's, how, that's, my, uh, that's my costume, my outfit to um, protect myself from the coronavirus at the moment, the gloves, the mask, etc. I don't know what the gun is about, but um, it is, uh, we are looking more and more like the people that we are researching uh, with it at times like this. Anyway, moving on from that, we, in future directions of this field, we don't, we shouldn't be unduly narrowing the field. We shouldn't be thinking about these are the only questions that we have to answer. We shouldn't be unduly narrowing it by looking just at it from certain disciplinary lenses. But when we're looking at interdisciplinarity, we should, we should be avoiding interdisciplinarity if it is interdisciplinarity just for the sake of it. We shouldn't feel that every piece of research we put out has to be interdisciplinary. There is great uh, value in having pure uh, research that is purely grounded in one discipline, and we can really learn a lot from that. But there are times it should be led by the questions that we're asking, the hypotheses that we're testing. That will decide whether a piece of research needs to be interdisciplinary or not. We need to diversify the questions asked. We need to uh, not just focus, we need to continue focusing on those old questions, but think about what are the new questions that we need to ask in order to get that broader understanding of terrorism research. But there is a huge continued need for academic rigor. We are now expanding in relation to methodology. We need to similarly expand in relation to analytical techniques, and we are seeing that, but we need to see that grow even further. We need to engage with theory and much more. We need to continue testing and retesting theories from a wide variety of disciplines as well as uh, those which have been applied specifically to terrorism research. And we need to broaden the scope of the voices heard. We need to engage with those who wouldn't normally um, be uh, traditionally have been uh, heard within areas, this area of research. Anyway, I will leave it there um, for the moment. That's a whistle stop tour of uh, some of the things that I found here, and I'm looking forward to taking any questions. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Um, thank you so much, John. That was absolutely um, fascinating um, and full of really terrific and some very provocative insights, uh, as I knew it would be. Um, and I just want to remind people that we encourage your, your questions, your comments, your, your engagement um, in dialogue with some of the things that John has had to say. Um, so let me begin with the first question, um, John, that we've, we've got so far. Um, so this this question is really about the fact that that part of the the growth and I think arguably one could say the health of the field um, is the sizable and increasing body of terrorism studies journals um, that that contribute to and in some sense you know help define the field. So journals like terrorism and political violence studies and conflict and terrorism, critical studies on terrorism, perspectives on terrorism. Uh, that's just the beginning of the list. But thinking about your call in the presentation to um, uh, uh, around, you know, what do we need to do now to advance and diversify um, the way in which we're looking um, at, at the questions that we're concerned with? What do you think are the journals that are both, I, I guess, the most important, but also the most innovative in the field, recognizing that their importance and their capacity to innovate may not actually be um, one and the same? It's an excellent question. It's, um, it's a tricky one as well. I think I think we do have some really good journals out there, terrorism, political violence, studies and conflict, terrorism, perspectives on terrorism, uh, a range of those. But I think some of the best terrorism research has been published outside of those, uh, outside of terrorism specific journals. And the reason I say this is because it's engaging with audience from those core, from other disciplinary, disciplinary areas. You had, there was, a, there was a brilliant book by Orla Lynch and Carmel Joyce, which said that looking at applying psychology uh, to terrorism research, saying that historically the, the terrorism research um, uh, that is purported to be psychology of terrorism research wouldn't have, wouldn't have been seen as high quality in the terrorism, in the psychology journals. So that's why when we see a journal like the American Psychologist publishing a special issue uh, of John Horgan's looking at the psychology of terrorism, it's gone through peer review from people external from the field who are or from this area who are really looking at it with that disciplinary lens on. So actually, I think some of it is coming outside of those journals. There's still brilliant research being published there, but the innovations and the 
the rigor is actually coming uh, from non-terrorism specific journals. The best, one of the best special issues I've read recently has been, um, and I'm sure I'm going to get the name of the journal wrong here, I think it was the South Asian, uh, South Asian Journal of Social Psychology, who published a special issue on disengagement and de-radicalization in Indonesia. This was brilliant. It was amazing. It was highly uh, engaging, rigorous uh, uh, research with great access to data, uh, wh who had been re uh, really high level analysis being done. We look at journals like Aggression and Violent Behavior as well, which are publishing, uh, which is publishing more terrorism research at the moment. Journal of Quantitative Criminology as well, all of these kind of journals. So within our own area of research, we're places like Perspectives on Terrorism, which are looking for the short form, uh, open access uh, journal articles are a great starting point. Um, but if we're looking to have that engagement, that innovation and engagement with policy, we need to have that short form. We need to have that open access. We also do need uh, to be to having shorter briefs as well. And this is why I wanted to have the podcast there to be able to have it uh, much more accessible. Um, so I think, like, that's a, the. I think some of the best terrorism research is being published outside of the terrorism journals. And I think actually the terrorism journals are understanding of that and are looking um, to develop that more. We can see um, terrorism, political violence, looking to have a much more quantitative focus, a more balanced uh, quantitative focus, having uh, a special issue coming out on ethics and terrorism research as well. And these are the kind of things that we need to have moving yeah. forward. Um, Look, but we need networks like Avert as well. We need to have these networks and be, open up the opportunities that uh, these kind of engagements have. It shouldn't be just about the traditional journals anymore. We should right. move, move forward from that as well. Well, let me, let me just ask you a quick uh, follow-up question before I get to the next one um, on the list, because I think it bears directly on what you're saying. Um, so Avert is a, is a champion of, of interdisciplinary research in the sense that we agree with you. I would, I would, uh, most of us uh, would probably agree with you. Um, that broad church, multiple, uh, multiple voices uh, approach is absolutely critical in terms of healthy diversification. But there is also the problem with interdisciplinary that I don't think we've necessarily touched on, and I'd love your views on this. And that is the fact that there are a number of disciplines that are actually hostile. Uh, to terrorism-based study and terrorism-based research. So that you have um, young researchers who are coming out of uh, a range of disciplines, including my own cultural studies, who are quite interested in taking up some of these questions, but the response from other people, uh, who, who one might call lions of the field in that particular yeah. discipline, um, are, are, are act actively chilling um, of uh, opportunities and interests. So what's your take on how we how we um, engage with some of the reluctance, some of the hostility, some of the suspicion, uh, some of the taboo, um, yes. you know, that, that, that can beset other disciplines um, when, when people in those disciplines try to um, grapple with some of the issues, uh, you know, that we look at in the terrorism space. Uh, this is, um, sorry, I, something just happened there on my screen. This is exactly uh, what I've found in the past few years as well. I had a, a colleague at University of East London called Aaron Winter, who had for years um, been looking through a sociological lens at far-right extremism, but he would never have classified himself as a terrorism researcher as well. And he would have been engaged from looking at it from, um, from a range of different areas uh, within sociology would looked at, at, at race. Uh, but he said within his uh, group of researchers, they would have had that reticence to engage with terrorism research. And for perhaps understandable reasons as well, when you look at, uh, at the foundations of, of his research area. But I think we do have an opportunity now with, the, with critical terrorism studies becoming more dominant within the area. We do have a more, an opportunity to to bring more researchers in to engage with this area in a way that is, a lot of the, the, the suspicion has been about the engagement with the state and the centrality of the state within our research. But if we have areas which are questioning that and which are saying we should be challenging that as well, it is becoming more welcoming. And we are actually, while at the beginning of critical terrorism studies, we were seeing 
um, it being a bit more siloed. And that was something coming out from the research as well. We are seeing now in recent years, a lot more engagement uh, across the areas as well, across critical terrorism studies and what they would call orthodox uh, terrorism studies. So I think there is the opportunity there, but it's to promote and to, to, to dispel these myths as well, because we like while there is problem solving state centric research out there, not all of it is some of the best research out there, uh, even ex uh, external from critical terrorism studies has not been uh, involved with um, uh, has not been state centric or necessarily problem solving. So we need to be able to highlight that. And this is also the point that uh, Thomas Hegammer was making in his speech, he was saying that we did have these areas uh, within academia, you weren't able uh, to get that, uh, those promotions, you didn't have the respect within, um, within these disciplines uh, to, to engage in a, in a career that we would want to. But if we are, by, the, by developing and making it more sophisticated, the methods and analytical techniques that we're using, that in itself will get the respect if we are able to promote that. And it's at times, when we look at what Silk was saying, that we didn't have that before, that will be one of the reasons why we didn't have the respect as well. So we need to be able uh, to have these eight periods of self-review, to be self-critical, and to expand on the methodologies, and to uh, make more sophisticated the methodologies and uh, analytical approaches that we have. And that in itself, if done properly, will get the respect uh, outside of the area. Terrific. Okay, so um, another question that I think um, goes back uh, to a certain extent to Max Taylor's comment um, about saying, look, um, it, it, if we're going to um, expand um, the health of the field uh, by um, um, expanding our collaborations, for example, with practitioners, and uh, really we need to bypass the politicians. I thought that was a very compelling um, uh, grab um, from the podcast. We need to bypass the politicians. Is it possible to escape the way in which the field of terrorism studies itself, or just terrorism, period, is, is politicized? And do you think that terrorism as a field is more susceptible to politicization than other fields, is, is the question that's been put here? I, I definitely think so. I, it's so difficult um, to be objective. Um, and that's something that I'm constantly grappling with my ha, ensuring my own objectivity. Um, it's an emotive subject. It's a highly political uh, topic. Um, we have to consciously uh, be trying not to politicize it and to be led by the data, be led by the research. Um, but through that engagement, if we're looking at the engagement with the non policymakers, with the non politicians, it's not about coming in and saying, we're gonna engage on terrorism research. We're gonna engage on the problems of terrorism. There are broader problems around this. And going back to the quote from Noemi Bahana, they, this isn't a special problem. We need to be able to say, okay, let's take, take a step back from this word terrorism. Let's take a step back from this word radicalization. And let's not try and answer all the questions on that at one time. Let's break this down bit by bit. Where, are, where is my expertise? And it's being confident in saying what your expertise is, and more importantly, what your expertise isn't as well, and what you can contribute in that way. And we need to be able to be controlling that narrative with our engagement with the policymakers and saying, this is what we know. This is what the evidence is saying. And this is what we don't know. This is where the gaps are. And this is where, what, what the gaps we need to fill. In order to move away from the politicization of it, by in a way parking that term terrorism, by in a way parking uh, that term radicalization to whatever extent we can, we can start to take a few, a few steps forward in that. But it's by seeing what's the practical day-to-day -day issues. And even when we are looking at the terms terrorism, radicalization, et cetera, not just considering uh, the violent activity, not just looking at those uh, small points of violence, but looking at what's happening in between, what's keeping people involved in a terrorist group, looking at the ordinary uh, nature of it, looking at the ordinary uh, nature of the decision-making processes involved. So some of my research is involved in uh, the role of trust within terrorism, terrorist decision-making. So looking at that ordinary role of trust within the decision-making process, 
looking at, well, what are the opportunities that people are given to, first of all, join the terrorist group, to leave the terrorist group and to stay involved with the terrorist group. And in a way, moving away from the ideological framing as well. Because if we look at the, the narrative of radicalization, et cetera, it's, often, it's all based around this engagement, this uh, buying into this, this specific ideology. But that's a very blinkered view of, of terrorist involvement. There are people I've interviewed who have said that they had no idea what the ideology of the group was. They joined for reasons that weren't political at all. So it's highlighting that as well. It's highlighting the reality of what the data are telling us in that regard as well, being open and honest about that and not always thinking that it has to be um, something that is new, some new uh, answer to the questions. There, is, there are questions uh, that have been answered in other areas of research. When we're looking at new religious uh, engagement with new religious movements, for example, uh, the work of Lauren Dorson and others like that, and drawing on that and drawing on that interdisciplinarity that wasn't political, but show that we're seeing where we're seeing the same processes and where there might be differences there. And that's a way, uh, it's not easy, but that, they, are, they are ways that we can look at stepping away from mm -hmm. politicization. Of the area. And, and, and I, think, I think that point goes right back to um, your earlier remark that um, the question about uh, what leads people to, you know, what motivates people to become involved in political violence is absolutely not the only question that we need to be asking or that we should be asking. Um, look, I am conscious of the time. We've got one more question. Um, well, we've got several other questions, but I think we've got time um, for one more. Um, so this, this is about whether um, some of the debate around stagnation uh, versus dynamism, you know, movement transformation. How much do you think that this reflects some frustration that after almost 20 years and considerable investment in research onto some of the original questions, perhaps, that the field began with, that the issues are becoming more complex and developing faster than the ability to publish evidence-based research and then develop deliverable and effective government programs that draw on that research. So, you yeah, know, no, it, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Yeah, no, this is a huge question. And this is why I'm delighted to see that, like journals like the TPV are publishing the online articles as quickly as possible. So just to give you an insight for this article that I was talking about here, and I know it's not, it's more introspective on terrorism research, but it's showing the way that they're publishing at the moment is that that was submitted about three months before it was, it was published online. So that's a fairly quick turnaround versus what we are, ha, had been used to. Now it hasn't been published in a, in a journal issue, but it's, it's there available for all online. And it is a, a problem, and this is why we have to diversify the way we communicate our research findings. This is why we have to expand the way it is. The, the frustration about the growing complexity actually I see as I see as showing um, the ground the the inroads that we've made in this area because we're able to now identify those complexities more because of the research of the past 20 years we're able to identify where these new areas of research have to go and it is showing that there is a lot more that needs to be done but it's also we need to set our ex expectations appropriately if we are to consider what are we talking about when we're looking at terrorism, we're not just talking about one strand of terrorism, we're not just talking about religious terrorism, we're not just talking far right, we're not just talking ethno-national, we're not just talking group act or alone act, we're not just talking people in the UK, the US, Australia, wherever. We're not just talking at one specific time, we're not just talking about a specific kind of weaponry or a specific kind of attack, specific kind of victim. There's a huge amount of heterogeneity among not just the actors themselves and the roles that they have, but in the actions that they're engaged in, in the targets that they have, in the motivations that they have. So when we have this complexity, we shouldn't be expecting that we would have all the answers. We shouldn't be expecting that it will be, become more simplified. As we go more in depth, things do emerge in a more complicated way. We do see that that complexity emerging and we do see where the gaps in the literature are as well if we are to take a compare terrorism research to criminology if we were to ask the question 
well, what causes crime? What leads people to engage in crime? We have that similar diversity and we would never expect us to be able to answer uh, that broad question uh, across in a 20 year uh, period. We do have to break the question down. We do have to move away from that word terrorism in a way and say, okay, what are the specific questions within this that we, we need to ask? What are the new questions as well as the old questions there? And we need to stop using the word, using the questions, what leads someone to engage in terrorist offending? We need to be now asking the questions, well, what leads a person in this context, going into this specific role with these specific ideologies, what leads them? What is going on there? We need to be able to draw on what Joshua Freilich was saying as well, and be able to not just look at the terrorism uh, or an extremist population. We You've just frozen there for a minute, John, but hopefully you'll be back in, in a second. We'll just give it another minute or two and hope that hope that John falls out. Mm. Um, all right, everybody. Um, uh, uh, John, John is frozen, um, which is very unfortunate because he was just um, uh, winding up a, a, a really terrific answer. Um, John, I hope you, I hope, I hope you, oh, you've disappeared. Okay. Unfortunately, um, we have we have lost John uh, just at the final moment. But it is um, we are at time now. I know we could have gone uh, for some time yet. I am aware that there were a couple of more questions that unfortunately. We couldn't get to, um, but I will do my best to connect the askers of those questions with John directly um, so that um, you can follow up. Um, although John has dropped off, um, could you join me in virtually thanking him? Uh, and I'll certainly convey this to him for a fantastic talk um, and a really interesting set of insights and questions. Um, thank you for your questions and for taking the time uh, to join us um, for this webinar tonight. We really look forward to having you join us um, for some future talks. Um, and of course, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Avert Whaling List, which you can do on our website um, so that you get advance notice of the webinars that we have coming up. Um, thank you again for being with us. I hope this was um, interesting and rewarding for you, and we look forward to seeing you next time. All righty. Good night, everybody.